With Those Who Wish Me Dead being released this weekend, I thought it'd be worth taking some time to look back at Taylor Sheridan's first film, Wind River. Wind River is the final film in Sheridan's Frontier trilogy, which also includes Sicario and Hell or High Water, but those films were not directed by Sheridan himself, so Wind River is the best display of who Sheridan is as a storyteller. Now the message of Wind River can feel fairly straightforward at times because part of it is given through beautiful monologues, but there are some aspects of the film that are rather ambiguous, and I'm going to give my best go at it, but I would love to hear your thoughts as well because just like we see in Wind River, investigations are pretty tough to conduct on your own. But without further ado, let's ride into the storm and see what we can find. The film begins in a very unique way. We see a girl, who will later be identified as Natalie, running through the snow, and it's easy to tell that her time is coming to an end. Now most directors, I think, in this situation would focus solely on the sound of her fading breath, the pain she's enduring. In other words, try to make the viewer feel her pain as intensely as possible. And although the scene does provoke empathy, Sheridan decides to put the voiceover of a girl reading a poem alongside it. The poem is integral to the film. Sheridan spends a lot of time emphasizing its importance, and I will talk more in depth about how he uses it later in the film in a way that I find quite mysterious and difficult to understand. Now, the poem contrasts the opening scene in a way that most viewers would not expect, because a massive theme in the film is the destructive capabilities of nature. Corey later on in the film tells his son that Natalie was killed by the cold, and also during the autopsy, a fair amount of dialogue is spent highlighting the point that, medically speaking, it was nature that killed Natalie. We later learn that the poem was written by Corey's daughter, Emily, and that makes perfect sense, because Emily spent her whole life witnessing the unforgiving winters of Wyoming, and it stands to reason that she heard of many people freezing to death in the wilderness. In the poem, Emily doesn't spitefully write about how brutal the world around her is, Instead, she paints a world that is free from the brutality of nature. The first stanza reads, There is a meadow in my perfect world, where wind dances the branches of a tree, casting leopard spots of light across the face of a pond. She goes on to describe this very Garden of Eden-like place, and there are a few lines that really stick out to me. The first one is, There will come a day when I rest against its spine, and look out over a valley where the sun warms, but never burns. So in this world, she sees and feels the best of nature. The environment is trying to support her, not tear her down. And she continues this idea a couple stanzas later. For in this place, winter never comes. It is here, in the cradle of all I hold dear. I guard every memory of you. Really beautiful stuff, and the winter never comes here line is brought up constantly in the film via the score. But curiously, Emily does take us out of her garden in the final stanza, and I will return to that towards the end of the video, but first I want to discuss the key theme of Wind River and the other Frontier films so we can best contemplate that last stanza. The brutality of nature is very much paralleled with the suffering of life in general in Wind River. As Ben tells Jane, blizzards come and go all the time, one hour it could be perfectly blue skies, the next hour you can't see a foot in front of you. They're unpredictable. And the same can be said about tragedies in life. One day Alejandro went to bed next to his wife, and the next day she was gone. One day Emily was alive and writing poetry, and then she wasn't. The story of Wind River is of course put into motion by another one of these random tragedies occurring. In Sicario, we see one way that humans can react to these sort of events through Alejandro. He chooses cold-blooded revenge. Using the language of Cory, Alejandro decides to fight the world. And the world does get the best of Alejandro. He might have gotten his revenge, but by killing the wife and kids of the man who destroyed his life, he proves that his morals have completely eroded. Corey chooses a different path, and we see that from the very beginning. Alejandro describes himself and Matt and the other men that Kate despises as wolves, predators. And in a world so chaotic and unforgiving, Alejandro's message to Kate that only the wolves will survive is a difficult one to rebuke. But Corey, he spends his time hunting predators. He's a protector. He's not a sheep, but he's also not a wolf. And what's interesting about Wind River is that when we meet Corey at the very beginning of the film, he's already gone through his transformation. He's a protector from the very start. The question for the audience is, how did Corey endure the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune without becoming like Alejandro? The answer to that question is found through Corey's relationship with Natalie's father, Martin, who is forced to confront the same pain Corey felt when Emily died and their scenes together are some of the best of the film, 
and it's some of Sheridan's most impactful writing in my opinion. Let's take the pain, Martin. You hear me? You take it. It's the only way you'll keep it with you. Later in the film, Martin's son even points out to Corey, this place takes everything from people. Just look at what it's taken from you. He says it to sort of justify the course he has taken in life. He had given pain to his entire family. They thought they'd lost him to drugs. He had destroyed all of his relationships. What Corey says to both Martin and his son is, Take the pain, don't share it. You are not going to even the score on life. You're always going to fall short. The best thing you can do is accept that life is suffering, but do your best to try and limit the amount you create. And it's through that process that you will become stronger. And it's for that reason Corey tells Martin at the end of the film, Be easy on Chip. Suffering is hard on young men. They don't have our practice. The other thing that ties directly into this idea is the strength that Natalie shows to run six miles barefoot in the snow after being raped. And when Jane asks Corey how far people can usually run in the snow, Corey gives this powerful response. Oh, I don't know. How do you gauge someone's will to live? Especially in these conditions. But I knew that girl. She's a fighter. The common answer to that question would be, well, I don't know, it depends on how healthy they were and their endurance, maybe their BMI. But Corey makes a point about the human will, and it extends past just Natalie's death, because the question could be rephrased as, how much suffering can you endure before life breaks you? Pete can only run a couple hundred feet before nature takes him down, but that's merely a representation of what happened to his soul long ago. Because think about how much suffering it took to break Pete. He tells Corey that it's so boring and there's no women here and there's nothing but snow and silence. That is all he can handle before he decides to spread his suffering. And when Corey looks at this pathetic piece of human debris that raped and killed his daughter's best friend, he doesn't torture him, he doesn't shoot him in the head, he gives him the same shot that he gave Natalie. And Sheridan talks about Corey's choice in an interview with DP30, which I'll put in the description. It's a great interview. And Sheridan says, Corey doesn't compromise his morals to kill Pete. It's an astonishing display of will and moral fortitude, and I think it makes Corey the ideal of the Frontier trilogy. Now with all of that in mind, let's return to the end of Emily's poem. The poem is only talked about once in the film directly, and it's clear that Sheridan knew the questions people would have about the poem, because the word you is used at many points, but we never learn who that you is. When Jane asks Corey who she wrote it to, he says, it doesn't matter who it's to, what matters is who it's from. And Emily's final stanza goes like this. And when I find myself frozen in the mud of the real, far from your loving eyes, I will return to this place, close mine, and take solace in the simple perfection of knowing you. The stanza echoes what Corey tells to his heartbroken friend after he finds out that his daughter died. You allow yourself to visit her in your mind. You remember all the love she gave, all the joy she knew. Corey felt the most intense pain one can face in life. And when I see characters dealing with the loss of a child in film, I'm always reminded of Theoden's line in Lord of the Rings. No parent should have to bury that child. It is as cruel a draw one can possibly imagine. It is the frozen mud of the real. But Emily and Natalie still live on in a world made of the eternal feelings they inspired in those they loved a world that can't be broken down by the ruthless material world that destroys just about everything else. When Corey says what matters is who it's from, I think what he's saying is pretty simple. It was from my daughter, whom I loved. Anybody who has lost somebody can take solace from the poem, so the exact recipient doesn't really matter in the end. As I mentioned at the beginning, lyrics from the poem are integrated into the score at different moments in the film. It's pretty tricky to hear at times, but the subtitles do help. I'll give an example here during the death of Pete. And on a side note, James Jordan, the guy who plays Pete, he's fantastic in the role, one of the most hateable characters in recent memory, and Sheridan clearly likes the actor because he's also in Yellowstone and Those Who Wish Me Dead.
I returned to this place and closed my eyes again. I kept pretty close track to what lyrics would turn up at different points, and the only other time where we get I return to this place is when Jane and the other officers arrive at the site of the rape and murder. It's very difficult to say if there's a direct intention to when and how the poem's lyrics are used. The lyrics come from one track in the score called First Journey, but Sheridan uses different parts of the track for different moments. Sometimes the same lines are repeated, and I think we only hear, and I close my eyes again, once, and that is when Pete dies. It could be just to solidify what we are seeing on screen, but with that said, when the voice speaks to us from the first person, and when Jane is returning to the scene of the crime, but she doesn't know it, and neither do we, the line almost feels like we are being talked to from beyond the grave by Natalie. Again, I'm not saying that was the intention, I'm going to play it safe here, but that's how it seems, sort of. If you watch Wind River in the near future, keep track of how Sheridan uses the poem lyrics in the score. It's a very interesting choice, to say the least, and maybe you'll come to a more definitive conclusion. That is the meaning I took from Wind River, Taylor Sheridan's first feature film. If you're interested on how the themes of the Frontier trilogy are intertwined, check out Ryan Hollinger's phenomenal video on it. He does a brilliant job. And also try to go see Those Who Wish Me Dead this weekend. Taylor Sheridan is a wonderful artist, and we should be looking to support his work so we can see more of his stories in the future. And of course, thank you so much for stopping by. It is a privilege to share my thoughts on films with people. And if you'd like to see more going forward, remember to subscribe on your way out. Have a fantastic rest of your day. I will talk to you soon.